back uh, to your seat. I want to welcome especially you who are uh, visiting with us the first time. It's, uh, it, in our church, we don't like to put first-time visitors on the spot, so we're not going to have you stand up and dance or anything like that. Um, but uh, we just want to welcome you and tell you that we have uh, information about our church and the gift for you who are visiting with us for the first time, and we're just so glad you are here. I hope that you can uh, join us and come back again this Sunday. And, and last Sunday, actually, it's a good time because we're talking about our church, just where, where we're going and uh, what God is doing in our midst or leading us to do. So um, let me begin this time in our teaching with prayer. Lord, we thank you that we got to um, celebrate with our graduates uh, Lord, thank you for our young people as they are continuing to be raised by their families uh, and, and ministered in this church. We thank you for those, those who invest their lives, their time, and attention to this next generation. And we know, Lord, how important that is uh, for your kingdom. And we pray, Lord, that you also bless these young, uh, young lives as they continue to grow, that they would grow even stronger in their faith, in their knowledge, and in their, um, their service to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, I, I kind of thinking about uh, our next generation kind of made, made me think about, you know, what was I like when I was a kid? Um, you know, I want, always wanted to be a doctor. I always wanted to be a doctor. I don't know, maybe because uh, I was really sick and I was in the hospital and injured, so... You know, something about someone helping me get better was impressive. Or, oh, my Sunday school teacher, you know, said, Luke, do you know there's a Dr. Luke, you know, in the Bible? And I was like, oh, really? Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm going to call you Dr. Luke. And I was oh, man, okay, maybe I should be a doctor. Um, but, you know, I also have just a natural desire, inclination towards, you know, science, biology, stuff like that. And not, not, so not, not only was a kid, but high school, that was my ambition and desire. And going to college, you know, I was going to major in some kind of life science or chemistry or something like that. I ended up in biochemistry because I had this aspiration of being a doctor. Well, as you can see, I didn't become a doctor, but I did get a doctor degree so maybe that's what God was saying. But, you know, through that process, and especially like in, in college, that um, I learned a few things about myself. See, uh, one of the things I learned was I'm not really disciplined, okay? Um, matter of fact, one of my professors said that to me. Not, not exactly in those words. He goes like, look, you just don't seem to have the same motivation as the other students. Okay, thank you. Um, you know, they wanted to work day and night because they wanted to get those straight A's and, you know, and, and, get, and, and I was in a very competitive school in biochemistry where all these pre-med people were, and I just, you know, I was like, I, don't, I just don't want to be there like that with them. And then I also found out I wasn't really that gifted uh, with a lot of the stuff. I could, it's the weirdest thing, but I got all A's in Chinese, you know, Mandarin class, and I just got all B's or worse in my majors classes. I think God was telling me something there too. That I, you know, I was just not that great with my own interest in biochemistry. And one of the things I found out through that process too was uh, I might have great reasoning and you know, uh, problem solving skills, but I'm horrible at memorizing anything. I should have known that since a kid, you know, Bible memory verses. Uh, everyone else would get stars for like memorizing tons of Bible verses, and I'd be like, I got one star, you know, something like that. So through that process, God was shaping me and showing me how he has shaped me uh, and, and also changing my heart, directing my heart, and ultimately into uh, being a, a, a full-time pastor. So after college, I worked for a few years at a pharmaceutical company called Abbott, and then I went to seminary because that's where I knew God was leading so I'm sharing this to talk about vision about our church, okay? So we, a church is the body of Christ, and it also develops kind of like a person. That we all, we're, we're a fairly young church still, we're around eight years old as far as GC2 and, and Cloudbreak, uh, I don't know, around 11 years. And sometimes when we start churches, we have this aspiration like, you know, we want to do this, and we want to do that, and we want these big dreams and stuff like that. And that's awesome, and that's great. 
But as time goes by, God leads us to understand us more ourselves or who we are. Just like we, in our own growth, we discover who we are, what we're really good at and what we're not, what we really want to do and what we were just thinking of when we were a kid and without a complete picture. So that's kind of the process that we are in. And last week I started sharing about how God has been uh, leading not only myself, but the staff and myself and the elders and uh, and others in, into a conversations, into contemplation, to prayer about where is God taking us, how has he shaped us, and, and where is he taking us. So this is a quick summary for the, uh, this first part. It's a quick summary of last week's. And if I'm flying by, um, we have these messages on, on video and audio, so you can take a look at it. But I, I, asked, I started telling us about answers to these questions. Basic question, who, what, where, when, how, okay? And so, well, first of all, who are we? Because if you know who you are, you get a greater idea of what God is leading you to, what God's will and what God's plan is. So same thing for us. Who are we? And I said last week that GC2's distinctive is that we are a church that is intentionally multi-ethnic, yet united by Christ's love, that is revealed in its people's loving ways, servanthood, and outreach. That, and that really is who we are. I mean, there's a lot of churches who are multi-ethnic and a lot of diversity, but not necessarily intentionally. We intentionally desire that. We want to build a community of people who love, are united by Christ, love Jesus, but doesn't necessarily share the same commonality of background, even uh, culture or language, and transcend that difference with the love of Christ. And it shows in a way already that we are a church that's warm, that's relational, that's caring, that's personal, that serves. I mean, we've got like 90% of people serving in some way in this church. And in the way we do outreach, you know, we have some events and stuff, but we really emphasize it's about you loving and serving others who don't know Christ and winning their heart first before uh, talking about the message of the gospel. Then I talked about where are we going. And we said, well, we got a mission, right? We have a mission as a church, and it's our mission statement of a church. The mission of a church is to glorify God by loving him, loving people, and making disciples locally and globally. That's what we, why we came to existence. But I said, the ultimate fruit of that, we want to see that it's through the programs of our church, through the people of our church, that people will be will meet Jesus, be fundamentally changed by him, and excitedly go and tell others. We want not the focus to be about us, but the focus about Jesus and seeing the evidence of Christ in us, through us, that people say, there is something here. There is something here and different about these people. And we say it's because of, not because we're just nice people, but it's because of Christ. It's Christ changing us, leading us, and we invite you to be a part of that and come and follow Jesus as we follow Jesus. So that's where we wanted to go and say, well, what's that going to look like? And said, so, well, we're going to have programs. Sure, we want our programs to be uh, really top-notch. We want, them, we want to be a church with exciting, growing uh, church where there's, you know, celebrative worship, powerful teaching, uh, programs for the children, for the youth, for the adults that people want to go to. I'm just excited to go to. Not just like, oh, I'm going to church. But yay, I'm going to church. Okay? So and we're all in an attractive environment. Well, everyone in church probably wants to do that too. But what's distinctive about us is beyond the program, again, it comes back to who we are, our people. And we want to be a people that are alongsiders. Uh, would be our greatest distinctive is that we would be a church of alongsiders. And uh, what's an alongsider? Well, it's like what Isaiah 2, 3 says. Many people will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that when we walk in his paths, the law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he knows the voice here is not... Hey, come, listen to me. I will teach you. I will show you the way. It says, no, come, journey with me. Let's walk together. 
That's the voice here. Come, let's walk together. Let's go to the mountain of the Lord together, to, the, to Jerusalem, to the temple, and let him, let him, his spirit, his truth, his word, teach us together his ways. And we will grow, we will learn from the Lord himself. And that's the alongside of philosophy. And we're doing that already. We're doing that in so many different ways with our children and students as mentors. We spent a little um, after the service talking about the children's ministry, how we want to change out the adult leaders in our children's ministry from just being a Sunday school teacher. We're not doing that anymore. We call them small group leaders. We're not doing that anymore. They're mentors. And we're inviting adults to invest their lives their time, their attention, their love, their faith into the children. And we also want to do the same thing with the youth and, and, and to work along with Stacy and John and have adults in our church uh, be their mentors and be their coaches as they go through middle school and, uh, and high school and college. Um, Outside our ministry, we want to look at, can we be helping kids come alongside them and tutor, encourage them who are struggling in school or youth that are facing challenges growing up and looking for direction? Um, we're also looking at, in the future, how can we help young couples to help them set a healthy foundation for their new uh, relationship or their marriage uh, or adults struggling in their marriages and parents who think, how do you do this parenting thing? I don't understand my kids and what's going on with them? And we talked last week also about the immigrant population in this area. You know, 37.5% of the students in this school alone are, um, are Asian, either you know, East Asian or South Asian. In the Monterey Ridge School, uh, the other elementary school to the north of us, I think the numbers are somewhere like 42.5%. As soon as I... You know, I hate windows that shuts you down. I don't know words like this. Okay. Um, here it is. 42.7% are Asian in Monterey Ridge. And I said last week that 21.5% uh, of the students in this school are la English language learners. That was really surprising to me. I just didn't expect that. And 17.5% of the students kids in the Monterey Ridge Elementary School are English language learners. And I said, you know, that's telling us in this area, there's a, there's a very large immigrant population, uh, particularly Asians, but there's also around 10.7% Filipino uh, in Monterey Ridge and 7.2% um, or 4.6% Filipino in this school. And it tells us that there's a large immigrant population, kids from immigrant families and also, if any of us have had that background, you know change is happening. Struggles are happening. Language struggles are happening. Cultural struggles are happening. Adjustments are happening. happening. Uh, generational problems are happening. And here we are, a multi-ethnic church, with people who are first-generation immigrants to people who have been here you know, for three, four generations of families here. But we're united in Christ. And we have these experience of knowing how life changes and adapts to this new environment. And we know Christ. And we have this opportunity, unique opportunity, to minister to these kind of people and families and children that many other churches who are all just one ethnicity cannot do. So who we are, where are we going? Um, and what's it going to look like? It's just the idea of what God is doing in our midst in, in developing a vision and a direction of how this church is going to look like. Now, I want to get into more of that direction and stuff. Um, Sandy, Sandy, where art thou? Sandy, somewhere? Sandy, your wife. Oh, okay. Did she, did she do all the, the. Did she have the handout? Oh, okay. Should she pass those out already? Oh, they're in the bulletin. Okay, okay. Okay, fantastic. Okay. 
Um, they're in the bulletin. Let's see. Okay. Um, I ended up pretty much last week saying, just like any, just again, like in life, you and I could be smart, educated, skilled, great at what we do in a profession, but that doesn't necessarily guarantee you success, right? I mean, there's other factors involved, but you need more than just smarts to be successful uh, or talent. Some of the most talented and smart people in their area aren't successful because they don't have maturity. They don't have those other things that's needed, people skills, ability to make good decisions, perseverance, uh, able to bounce back from failure, you know, stuff like that, right? That's what you need in life in order to be successful. And likewise for a church, just because we know the Word of God, just because we even teach it, just so we even know the purpose and plans He has for us, if we don't have maturity, we can't be and become what the Lord wants us to be. Okay? So we need to grow in terms of developing maturity. Um, so how do we get there? Maturity is required, both personal and organizational. And I talked about the six B's was our path to personal maturity last week. And this week, I want to go into more details with that handout that you have. Because what we do is just say, okay, let's all be mature. No, we didn't say that. It's like, well, what does that look like? What does maturity look like, um, in the, in, well, growth towards maturity look like in a child or in a youth and ultimately as adults? And let's set those as our goals. That this is what we want to build, this is what we want to develop in your children, in your teenagers, and ultimately in you yourself as adults. So the first thing we said is people need to feel like they belong. In the past, you want people to grow in maturity spiritually, you say, oh, you need to believe first. But nowadays, people need to know they're connected with you. Um, they, they need to understand that you're a trustworthy person. That the church is a wholesome body of people and not some crazy lunatic cult or something like that, okay? So the first is they need to build that kind of relationship with you so that you have the right to be heard. And that's about belonging. And then also, we like to talk about children's ministry. We don't just want kids to go like, okay, I'm going to Sunday school and there's some stranger who's teaching me this stuff and uh, gets me some uh, stars and candy at the end and I'm done. They're not going to enjoy it. They're, they're, they're not going to grow through that. And the same thing here with the youth and, and the adults. It's about community and understanding and experiencing the love and the reality of God within community leads to a greater belief. So, it's the first some things we, we want to do is work on belonging. So, I'm going to have you flip back and forth, but first I'm talking about children, then I'll talk about youth. So, working with Jill, we, and, and also Mike Stringer, and, and others in the leadership, we said, well, what, how, where do we want our kids to experience belonging? So, we want them to belong, enjoy belonging in the family. So, ideally, by the end of fifth grade, say, hey, our kids will know that they're loved and valued and by their parents, and their parents are proud of them. Now, you think, of course that's true, right? You know. And we as parents go, of course. But, you know, it was somewhere in college. One of my daughters said to me, look, we know you love us, talking about the parents, okay? But, you know, we're not sure you're proud of us. I don't know. Of course I'm proud of you. You know, and I thought back like, you're right. I never, we never said those words. I am so proud of you. Congratulations, you graduated high school. Awesome, you know. But not those words like, I'm proud of you. We always say, I love you. I love you. And there was a distinction. It was an important part in their life and growth. It's like, you know, we need to know you're proud of us too. So I learned from there. I need to keep on saying to my kids, I'm proud of them. So just, just a little touch here about enjoying 
that their parents love them and are proud of them, and the kids know that they have a role, they have a responsibility in their family. And within church, they have at least one friend. And they also know they're loved, valued, and mentored by several adults at church. So that they come to church saying, hey, there's people who love me. There's adults who care. I'm not just some stranger in the crowd. And I got friends. I got a buddy here at GC2. And, we, we, um, and of course, we want them to enjoy belonging to Christ. And they're happy in the knowledge that God is their creator. And they have a heavenly father who loves them and highly values them as their as child. And they then know that their role is to glorify God and enjoys that role. Without youth, same thing. Now, youth, uh, they want to appreciate the family too because they're in this stage where like, oh, mom and dad, eh, you know, old-fashioned. It's kind of, you know, I don't want to see drop me off a, a block away from school, mom, so I can just walk in by myself and don't give me a hug and don't give me a kiss, please, you know. Okay, but still, in their heart, right, they need you, mom and dad, right? They value you. Um, and, and so we want to help them continue to build that part of their life. They honor all the family members. Uh, they turn to family for wisdom and comfort. Not just their friends. Not even just people at church. But they will actually turn to mom and dad or older sibling and, and ask for uh, advice and support. And they joyfully participate in helping family activities. And they strive to communicate well with family members. So we set those goals, but Stacy and I worked on this, and Stacy came through this with, hey, this is what we want to do with our youth. And with our church, the same thing, uh, that they build on what's happening in the children's ministry, but also take initiative and involve themselves in the church, uh, become members of the church, has a community of friends at church, and looks for opportunities to serve in the church. And I won't go, um, go on to too much more details, but we are added this part about honoring relationships god honoring relationships in their romance and their friendship and, and uh, in their witness and so forth so maturity in our understanding needs to begin with a foundation of being in community together and then we have the opportunity through those relationships through that trust to build and strengthen and that's important parents you know um, I don't know what kind of background you grew up in, but sometimes, at least for me, my background as a, you know, in, in, in this Chinese-American family was just simply like, you know, parents were the authority figure. Do this, do that, get good grades, do well, okay, very good, do more. <laughs> you know, like, uh, and that was it. And I had to learn as, a, as an adult, as my own, as being a parent, you know, what it was to nurture, to relate, to, to not just be an authority figure. And not that, you know, we as parents are just trying to be their friend, but to be this relational leader to our children, right? That's, that's where we need to go. Okay, I've said enough about belonging because i got other six other things to do, five others. Okay, believe, believe. I'll go, okay, is next is that we want to help them believe. And of course, that involves saving faith. We want them to know the gospel, the truth, and, 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 and understand it and receive Christ. But that's just the beginning, right? That just means being born again. Would you like to just stay in a state when you were just born? <laughs> this newborn, helpless newborn? Of course not, right? And likewise, faith is not just being born again. It's growing into something else. And do you know what God intends for you to have in your faith? It's up there. Hope. You know, the purpose of your faith in terms of the emotional, heartfelt experience is hope. You say, well, you know, I thought it was holiness, Luke, or something else. Well, here's what the words are. Let's read this. Read Romans 15, 4. Read this together. For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement provided, we may have hope. What is the purpose of everything of scripture that was written in the past, written to teach us, 
So that through the endurance taught in Scripture and encouragement they provide, we what? Have hope. God's purpose for you through your faith in Christ is not just, like, oh, I have eternal life, and who I'm done, I'm good. But that you will be a hope-filled person. Tell me, what, you think of someone who's hopeful, what else would you say to, about that person? Pardon? Optimistic. Joyful. What else? Confident. Yeah. That is what the Lord is wanting to, to develop and build in you as part of your emotional life and state. Is I give you hope. Hope that gives you confidence, gives you perseverance, gives you joy. Um, what else do we say? Optimism. Amen. Are you an optimistic person? Are you a positive person? Are you hopeful? Are you confident? That's what God is awfully moving you towards. So we looked at our children, and um, um, I'm going to skip that because we said some of these things. But, yeah, that we, he wants us to have confidence in him. Um, we have priorities in the right place. Command those who are rich in the present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides with everything for our enjoyment. So you get the right priorities, you know, we're pointing in the right direction, and well-grounded. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Note some people who are well-grounded. You know, maybe you are one of those. You just kind of know what to do, how they're just, they're level-headed. Uh, things don't get them riled up. When crises come, they just kind of, they're grounded. And here's here, Hebrews 6.19 is saying, that's what God wants to build in you. We have this hope as an anchor a foundation of the soul, firm and secure. You're not going to be tossed about by the wind and the waves and storms of life when you are a person who is taking your belief from just your knowledge, not, not leaving your belief in knowledge and head knowledge, but taking it to your heart and soul saying, this is the truth, this is real, I'm confident of this, nothing is going to stir me up. So with our kids, you look at this, um, saving faith. I won't go into that. But we want them to be hope-filled people. So we see that they're, we want our kids to experience that they're happy, that Jesus is always with them, uh, sees that the Bible is relevant to them, uh, are memorizing key promises of God and allowing the word of God to speak to them or assure them of God's promises and God's faithfulness. And then with our young people, our youth, our teenagers, they're, they're growing in faith. Yeah, they, they have knowledge, but also they understand basics of apologetics. They're assured of the truthfulness of the Scripture, know the difference in worldviews between Christianity, secularism, evolution, and other religions, and, and know basic theology. But again, it's to lead to something else, that they would be hope-filled people. We, you know, that they experience God's gracious forgiveness and love. Be more committed to Christ despite trials and temptations. They're not going to get floundering because of the hardship and trials. And they're seeking after God's will for one's life and is confident that God's plans and purposes are the best. Would you like that in your kids? Absolutely. So you know what? I'm not just talking about church here. Again, if you're a parent... Take this to heart for yourself. Set these not only say, oh, that's great that GC2 is doing this. Hey, you know what? I need to do this. I need to figure out how to coach, encourage, pray for, teach my children to have that kind of hope, that kind of confidence, that kind of certainty and firmness in their life. And we as church and you as parents partner together. The next one, oh, I'm supposed to move these things along. See, we have these banners here, and uh, you say, what's it there all this time? These are our six Bs. So we have belong, and we have believe, and then 
we have breakthrough. Okay. As I've been in ministry, I was like, you know, it seems to be an assumption in a lot of churches and ministries and seminary and stuff. You just teach the word. Um, you have a good program. People will grow. People will learn and people will grow. And I didn't see that happening on many people. Some people, of course, they did. And I said, there's some people that have something that's holding them back. And as I studied more, read more, there's this concept of spiritual strongholds in people. Spiritual strongholds are places that Satan and evil and sin has control over. He could, someone can be a believer, accepted Christ, but there's places in their life that they have not been able to surrender to Christ because the power of sin is still there and so powerfully holding on. So even they hear the word, they come to church, they're in fellowship, there are things that are, are they're hiding from God. Until those areas are broken through, there isn't spiritual growth. So I said, you know, we as a church, we just can't be teaching and counseling and community and serving. Expect that's all we need to do. We need to help people have breakthroughs. Breakthrough. Breakthrough what? The power of sin. This Galatians 5.17, let's read this together. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intention. See, in all of us, with, though God, Christ has set us free, we are still held captive by sin. And there's a spiritual battle going on in you, in me, and everyone. And we need that, so we need that breakthrough. Because if we follow the sinful nature, this is what happens. When you follow desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, and dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Put it together, that causes brokenness, sinful habits, even addictions. All of this is a result of the power of sin in people's lives. And we want to come to maturity, we have to break through. We have to break through. Now, we, church, you, I, don't have the power to break through because it's the power of the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God who sets us free. But the Spirit, let's read this. The Spirit, Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. It's the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that causes the breakthrough. But we can be there to set the environment. We can be there to bring attention to that need and provide for that. What we want to see, again, back to your handout, is among our kids that they wouldn't be afraid of mistakes. They wouldn't be afraid of failure. They wouldn't be afraid of God's punishment because they know there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. We want them to experience a freedom from the power of sin by experiencing freedom from insecurity. They have the courage to lead their comfort zone, to have healthy emotional balance. Remember we said, said here in Galatians 5.19, uh, 21, about what the flesh does includes 
quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, hostility, dissension. You just think your kids are having a temper tantrum? It's not just a temper tantrum. There's something spiritual going on. And our youth, to learn what it means to be spirit-led and spirit-filled, and internalize uh, what it means to walk in freedom and share that knowledge with others. And the whole end result is that people will become, become like Christ. Because the purpose of our discipleship is to become like Christ. As is defined in Ephesians 4.11, what is maturity? Maturity, in that yellow hot light, is attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And Luke 6.40 says, The student is not above the teacher, but everyone's fully trained will be like their teacher. So we want our next generation to enjoy being a disciple of Christ, want to grow in character like Christ, of values, knowledge, values, spiritual habits in their life. And as youth, to grow as disciples too and seeking out ways to grow through Bible study, mentorship, um, being discipled by members of the church, serving as an example of Christ's likeness to younger students, and learned that they learned the spiritual habits and have developed those habits in their life. And if we're becoming like Christ, then we bless others. We serve the Lord. We bless the Lord. We bless others by loving our neighbors and serving them. And ultimately, so that we bear fruit. And, wah! <laughs> Thank you, Khan. <laughs> that we bear fruit. I'm just making sure everyone's awake. Okay. Um, and that we are disciples making other disciples. Now, What, what, what does this all mean? First, it means we have our work cut out for us, okay? All right? These are essential but ambitious goals that our youth ministry and our children's ministry are committed to working on. We're just not just doing a curriculum. We're not doing a program. We're investing in our next generation for these purposes and these goals. And it also means we need adults to come alongside our children and our youth. That's why we are moving from just a one-month commitment of teachers and leaders in the children's ministry to at least three months. You can track and mentor and be with the kids for a quarter. We need the same for our, our, our children's I mean, youth ministry. It's not just, oh, children, okay, I mean, youth, we got Stacy and her fiancé, John, and go, oh, they're done, we got, we're taken care of. No, we need adults. We need partners. We need role models from the church, too, and I just want to challenge some of you who particularly don't have kids in the youth, you know, your own kids in the youth ministry to invest as small group leaders and discussion leaders with Stacy. Uh, her format is to teach and then break into groups and talk about the teaching, how to apply, what does it mean, and pray together and disciple that way. And also on Friday nights with the outreach with other kids. One of the things you might have been wondering all this time, just talking about youth and children. How about the, how about the adults? How about people in this room? Well, we're working on the six B's for the adults, too. As a matter of fact, we would have worked on it as our leadership meeting this past Tuesday, but we had to deal with this thing called a shed. <laughs> so, you know, Satan again is trying to, like, get us off track, but we're, we're going right back on track. But I'm wondering, as you're looking at this list for children and, and for youth and all these goals, I'm wondering if any of you has just uh, thought to yourself, I don't even do that. Any of you? Any of this? Like, uh, yeah, like, oh. Um, one of the things about making disciples is 
being able to explain the gospel. Oh, can I do that? Or having spiritual habits, prayer, scripture reading, devotions, fellowship. It's like, oh, I don't do that. And I may not even know how to, I'm not even experiencing a hope-filled life. Talk about the children and the youth being hopeful. I'm, I'm, I'm a pessimist. I got to get down on things. Well, let this at least not just be, oh, that's great to know that church is doing this. And let this also be a personal challenge to you as adults. Because if you've walked with Christ and known Christ for a while, you should be the example. You should be the role models. That the younger generation looks at and say, there are adults at GC2. I can see they love the Lord. They have faith. They have hope. They walk with Jesus. They, they, they have community with me. They, I can see them blessing. I can see them bearing fruit in their life. I want to follow their example because I really admire it and respect them. That's, that's our role, right? That's, that's the mature believer's role. That's the adult's role. That's the parent's role. So don't just look at what I just shared with you. It's like, oh, that's great. You're going to do that with the kids, youth. Wow, bravo, good job. Go staff, go. It's all of us together, beginning with our own walk with God, with our own belief, with our own sense of community, with our own breakthroughs in our life, in our walk with Jesus, in our obedience, and in our own example of becoming like Jesus and blessing others, and bearing fruit. So, I share this with you as a challenge to grow in maturity, even as we seek to grow the next generation. Lastly, real quickly, um, we also need to grow organizationally. And I talked about the critical mass. We need to grow to a size that allows us to have the manpower to do these things, to have the, f- the resources, even the funds to do it. So we talked about needing a point where we reach a p- critical mass where it's a minimum number of active participants that gives the ministry enough momentum to be sustainable and attractive for newcomers to remain. There's energy, there's attractiveness that comes with a critical mass. And we set this target that we want to reach as a church, around 150 to 200 uh, regularly on Sundays. And the critical mass is around 20 in our youth ministry and around critical mass of at least 15. And we said, if we have 15 active kids, 15, 20 active youth, 150 to 200 active people on Sundays, we got a lot of energy. We have resources. We have momentum. We need to build to that. So I, we set some goals. In 2017, we want to complete and, and start to implement the six B's vision for all age groups. That's what we're doing right now. We are revamping the children's ministry to be more effective and attractive. That's what we're doing uh, over the summer and the fall. Uh, we are going to work on reprogramming the worship service. And I'm still praying over that. And when I decide we're going to do it, I'll let you know. Um, and we're going to, working already to start mentoring students, whether the children our youth, and we need more mentors for the youth. But we also have, uh, uh, we're casting vision to the church and to leaders. Hello? We're doing that? So, following our our plan here. But we also have a three-year plan. It just happens, it's 2020. Do you like that, Steve? Craig? 2020 vision. Okay. You get it? 2020 vision, all right? So our 2020 vision is that we will reach that critical mass that we just talked about by year 2020 or end of 2020. So we're in a three, three and a half year term. We want to at least by that time reach that critical mass. We want to at least have two evangelist programs or events per year for children, youth, and adults. That we will have really stand on two legs of the ministry, not just all the ministry that that we have now just mainly for believers, but every generation has a ministry to the unchurched, unreached. And not just an event, 
but a program, something that is consistent or at least runs over a period of time. We're praying that God will allow us to have at least 20 people to receive Christ through GC2 Ministries and 20 people be baptized at GC2. You know, that's just only like six and one-third, six and two-thirds persons per year in three years. <laughs> you know, I think we can do that. Um, we also have, want to have at least, okay, this is why I'm getting creative with my math, okay? 20 divided by 2, which is 10. 10 adult small groups of various kinds and ages. Uh, increase our annual giving by at least 20%. And, is there not one more? Oh, yes, okay. Have more than 20 plus 20. 40% of members go on short-term missions. We probably have at least 20% of our people already going on short-term missions at one time or another. We want to double that. And we're praying, you know, the Lord will provide for us at least 2,000 square feet of, of classroom space or something, okay? The more, even better. You know, um, we're... S- we're, we're just aiming to move forward. We will tr- we're going to want to trust the Lord, and we, we want to work hard and build up and strengthen this church. Um, but we want to go beyond just be c- reaching critical mass. 2025, we're praying that we could be able to be around, have two worship services, and this is important because it allows those who serve, like now, in the children's ministry or youth ministry, to also attend worship. Right now, they're sacrificing their ability to, right now to be here. And we hope that at least 250 are in our church on Sundays, with at least 12 baptisms per year, with at least three pro- evangelistic programs per year, and at least, and we, God will provide us to own a facility for community service and internal needs. Um, and our annual giving will exceed 500000 Now, I can't say with certainty, as we go out further like this, this is indeed what God is leading us to. I think the closer to 2017, is a yes, this is where indeed. And as we move further out, we're, we're praying, we're trusting, but we believe in these things, and God may show us differently. But we want to be on this course. We want to be moving. You know, there's someone who said, you can't steer, you can't drive a parked car. You can't drive a parked car. Yeah, you've done that as kids, you know, sit in the driver's seat and, oh, you know, honk the honk, turn the wheel and stuff like that, but the car's parked. You can't move that car and direct it unless it's, it's, it's moving. So we want to be moving. And then the Lord can sh- correct the steering. But we just parked and say, oh, waiting, waiting, waiting. God can't use us and, and drive this church forward. I close with this. Why? Why are we doing this? Let's remind ourselves why we're doing this. Because of a mission. Because we're here to glorify God by loving him, loving people, and making disciples locally and globally. Our mission statement. But as I've been asking that question, I'm like a kid going, why, why, Lord? Why do we want to do this? You know, do you have kids who go, why, why? It annoys, you know, annoys you to death, right? I said, why, Lord? And he gave me this verse, 1 John 4, 19. We love because he first loved us. Why would we sacrifice? Why would we commit to this? Why would we go after, uh, outside of a comfort zone and, and all these things? Why couldn't we just go to a nice, comfortable situation? No. It's because he loved us first. He sacrificed. He gave. He was generous to us. Therefore, we love, we give, we sacrifice as Christ has done for us. And ultimately, because we desire to do God's will, and we believe this is his will for us. So I invite you, uh, whether you've been here from the very beginning 
or this is your first Sunday, to join in, to join in and share this one heart with us and be a part of what God is directing us to in the coming years. I also ask you to pray. I pray that the Lord would empower us and enable us to do so. Pray for us as a staff. This is something that just came up in our Friday staff meeting. We talked about uh, at the end of the meeting, I asked, what's your top prayer request? And four out of our five staff asked for prayer about getting enough sleep and uninterrupted sleep for ourselves. We, you know, you know, our staff is dedicated. We, they, they love the Lord, they love the church, and they, they're concerned, they work hard, and they got stuff on their mind about people, about the church. Um, I wake up 3 o'clock in the morning thinking about stuff. I have to tell myself to stop. Stuff like that. So I ask for your prayers. Pray for the church, but pray for the staff, and that God would move and enable us and empower us to do great and mighty things in his name. And then, thirdly, I um, invite you to, to partner, to give, um, to enable us to do the things that God is leading us to. Well, we're going to revisit this. One of the things the elders said um, is like, Luke, we need to hear more about where we're going. And so this is a big two weeks lump sum. We're going to come and return over and over. And, and someone that's in our leadership training said to us in, the, in this class, is like, when you get tired of saying the same thing over and over again, that's when people first get it. You know, right? Are you, have, have you done that with your kids? Repeat, repeat. Like, oh, oh, I didn't know I was supposed to do that. I didn't know. Until like you're sick and tired. Like, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to clean my room. Oh, okay. You know. So and t- I, I, my gauge of whether, you know, I, I need to stop talking is when I get really sick and tired of talking about this. But uh, I thank you for your attention. I thank you for... Uh, your devotion and commitment. I know this church, uh, just even this past week, is a church that pulls together. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do through us and in us as we work together. Are you? I hope so, too. Um, Jess, can you uh, call us to, uh, to one more worship song and uh, we'll close out the service. But let me pray. Father, Thank you for the, this period of time in our church's life that uh, you've called us to ponder, to think, to pray, uh, to communicate about where you're leading us, what you have shaped us to be, and where you want to take us. And Lord, at times, even for myself and for the staff, it feels overwhelming. And I'm sure, as all of us have families, work, our own lives to care of, our own health, our own finances, and all the other things in our personal life to take care of, there's a tug of war going on. So, Lord, you know, this all sounds good, but wow, it sounds like a lot of work. Well, how are we going to do it all? Now, and, and all these things tug at us, but Lord, today we just want to ask that you give us the faith to believe, to be hope-filled people, that as you have called us to be a church, as you have called us to be part of this church, you have also enabled us, empowered us, and equipped us to do the will that you have called us to accomplish. You don't just call us to do something and say, hey, figure it out, bye. You're here, right here with us. And so, Lord, we pray for faith. We pray for that kind of confidence, that positive future-orientedness that comes with truly believing. And and we look forward, as the days ahead, 
to see how you will continue to grow this church, grow us, mature us, raise up the next generation so that this church can even do more and greater things for the kingdom of God. This we pray in your son's name.